I'm Shirley Mark. I'm Shirley Mark, and I work at the Tisch College of Civic Life. I'm pleased to be your MC for tonight. Our first speaker, who will welcome everyone, is Nadine Arbery. Provost Arbery is Tufts Provost and Senior Vice President, and she is a member of President Monaco's Senior Leadership Team. Along with her many other responsibilities overlooking Tufts eight schools and a number of interdisciplinary centers, the Office of the Chief Diversity Officers of Tufts are integral members of the Office of the Provost. Prior to Tufts, Dr. Aubrey was Dean of the College of Engineering at Northeastern University for seven years. Before Northeastern, Dr. Aubrey was head of the Department of Mechanical Engineering and University Professor at Carnegie Mellon. Dr. Aubrey is an elected member of the US National Academy of Engineering, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics, to name just a few. Welcome, Provost. Thank you so much, Charlie, for this very humbling introduction. So good afternoon and welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for today's Tufts Table as we continue to work together on making our institution, Tufts, a more inclusive, just, and equitable place. As part of Bridging Differences, Tufts Table is our signature program that promotes dialogue across divergent perspectives among faculty, students, and staff across the university. The goal of such discussions is to advance understanding and communication through effective programming and to enable all members of the Tufts community to experience a sense of belonging. Today's Tufts table is the second part of a series of two events related to the important work on anti-racism taking place across our institution and focus on a topic that is at this time more pertinent than ever. Anti-Asian and anti-Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, AAPI racism in the United States. Today's event is entitled Anti-Asian Hate and Systematic and Systemic Racism, sorry, Breaking the Cycle, sponsored jointly by the Office of the Provost and the Bridging Differences Initiative. I would now like to thank Aaron Parano, Director of the Tufts Asian American Center, who will give introductory remarks and all involved in the organization of this event, particularly our Associate Provost and Chief Diversity Officers, Rob Mack and Joyce Saki. It is now my pleasure to introduce Joyce, who will say a few words to you. Thank you again. I will provide a short introduction for Dr. Saki. Um, Dr. Joyce Saki is Associate Provost and Chief Diversity Officer for Tufts Health Sciences Schools. And she heads the newly formed bias education and resource team for the same campuses. As a member of the university's academic and provost councils, she works closely with leadership to fulfill the goals for diversity and inclusion among the schools and centers on the Boston and Grafton campuses. At the School of Medicine, Dr. Saki is the Dr. Jane Murphy Goen, Professor and Dean for Multicultural Affairs and Global Health. She co-chairs the Bridging Differences Initiative. Welcome, Dr. Saki. Thank you so much, Shirley, and um, really appreciate that warm introduction. Um, welcome to all of you. I'm, I'm delighted uh, to uh, welcome you to Tufts Table. And as you heard from Provost Aubrey, Tufts Table is one of our signature uh, events um, as uh, part of the 
provost office and also bridging differences. And I, I thought I might just share a couple of words about how we've previously done Tufts Table just to pique your interest and hopefully give you a taste of what we should all be looking forward to. So Tufts Table, the reason it's called Tufts Table was intended to be an occasion for breaking bread and engaging in difficult conversations. It always goes a little easier when there's food around when you're discussing difficult topics. So we have previously done several Tufts Table events co-sponsored by uh, various schools and units um, over dinner. Uh, and so um, fortunately to tonight, you're, we're not gonna be able to serve you dinner, but we do hope that you have some dinner prepared uh, after this. Uh, and the goal, as you heard from Provost Aubrey, is for us to really um, begin to engage in perspectives that are different from our perspective and to learn from one another. And so this topic for today is absolutely fitting and appropriate, not only in terms of what Tough Stable is about, but what Bridging Difference is about, and, and also really fits into our anti-racism initiative. So great, it gives me great delight, as many of you who attended last week's uh, presentation from Erica Lee, she really set the stage for us to engage in this conversation. So I hope that many of you were there last week and uh, are looking forward to really um, delving more deeply into some of the concepts that she raised last time. So thank you again for coming and I appreciate uh, the opportunity to speak. I'll turn things back over to Shirley. Thank you. Thank you so much for your words. Next, I would like to introduce Aaron Perano. Aaron is the director of the Asian American Center, which is one of six identity centers within the Division of Student Diversity and Inclusion. A graduate of Boston College, where he earned both his bachelor's degree and a master's degree in higher education administration, Aaron has spent his career supporting Asian American students and advocating for the community. He is currently a doctoral student studying higher education. Welcome, Aaron. Thanks, Shirley. Uh, and thank you to Provost Aubrey, the Bridges, Bridging Differences planning team, and everyone in attendance. Uh, last week, Dr. Erica Lee shared with us a brief history connecting what continues to happen in the country to Asian Americans to a history of violence linked to white supremacy, capitalism, and colonialism, to name a few stru structures. While she was speaking, um, you know, the verdict for the Derek Chauvin trial was also waiting to be announced. Connecting the issues now and broader movements for solidarity, um, like linking the work between the CDO's office and what's been happening for the Division for Student Diversity and Inclusion is important. Um, while yes, some of the statistics that were you know, mentioned um, in the email um, for the event, like how um, the impacts of violence have increased in the Asian American community, statistics also show that uh, this is still not to the same degree that impacts um, that the Black American community faces. This is not to put trauma into a competition, but instead implicate the correct structures that place Black and Brown bodies at risk. While yes, all oppression is connected, our liberation is also connected as well. We can't separate violence happening in the Asian American community from the violence that's happening in Black communities, in the LGBT community, or the Latinx and other marginalized communities. Um, a great report by um, Janelle Wong and Karthik uh, Ramakrishnan from AAPI Data um, did a report on this, looking at statistics of how violence has impacted um, communities of color since um, the start of the pandemic and um, you know what are the important takeaways from you know what's being reported well yes it is important to recognize the violence that's happening to communities especially to our elders it is also important to recognize that this violence has been ongoing and it's only now that there's been attention paid to this you know, connecting this to what's happening on our campus, it's important to emphasize that most anti-racist practices that this university has implemented has not considered Asian and Asian American students, faculty, and staff. After the violent events in Atlanta where eight lives were taken, six being Asian American women, to the violence in Indianapolis where Sikh Americans were targeted, to on our own campus this week where students were being targeted for their race, 
the university's response has been to ask those who look like the victims to reach out to be the ones that teach you how to remedy the situation. Too often are we placing the solutions of remedying racism on those who are experiencing its impacts. The university and higher education generally operates under a scarcity model of equity, that there's only enough resources around to remedy certain issues of diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice. Where we saw that this year, that resources can be mobilized to solve issues such as they arise, like a global pandemic, critical race theory reminds us that racism is persistent and permanent and that our actions to dismantle these racist structures must also be as persistent and permanent. Reliance on models like the model minority myth, how Asian Americans have been de-racialized and used as a racial wedge in politicking have impacted the community in a way that renders the Asian and Asian American community invisible in issues of equity and inclusion. Even on our understanding of who is Asian, kind of um, emphasizes this as well. Oftentimes, the face of Asian America is one that focuses on East Asian ethno uh, hegemony, excuse me. Violence has been happening in our communities, but why is it only now that folks are choosing to pay attention? I think it's important to say what we mean and mean what we say when we're saying that there is violence in our communities. Often the phrase of late has been to stop AAPI hate when community leaders in our Pacific Islander communities have been important to emphasize that this is not an issue that is broadly impacting Pacific Islander communities, that this is an issue that is broadly impacting mostly Asian American communities. And that certain aspects and certain communities within the Asian American umbrella have been consistently facing violence like our South Asian community has been since 9-11. It must be in systemic and state, uh, I mean, sorry, if the university is committed to stopping AAPI hate and AAPI violence, then this needs to be looked at beyond the interpersonal acts. It must also be looked at in systemic and state-sponsored acts as well. How are we responding to what is happening in our AAPI undocumented communities? How are we stopping the participation in our own erasure of Boston Chinatown? Yes, we must stop Asian hate, but to use a phrase that absolves white supremacist structures without interrogating this hate um, will lead us to not break the cycle, if that's what we're looking to do, if that's why we're all here at this tough table, is to break the cycle of hate. What work needs to be done now is that there needs to be a greater emphasis on ethnic studies, including Asian American studies, but not only for the people that, you know, would more directly benefit from those classes, but everyone. I think everyone here has it in the capacity to you know, involve themselves in local politics and their school boards to demand that ethnic studies be emphasized in K through 12 curriculum. We need to disaggregate our own data on our campuses to see who our Asian American students are and in what ways can we serve them better. Knowing that there are educational disparities amongst Southeast Asian, South Asian, East Asian, and Pacific Islander communities. We need to look at the demands from students. We need to be a student-centered university that centers those needs of our community. But also look at where the work is already being done. Look at the work like the Tufts Action Group, which has been doing amazing work to really transform this university into truly being an uh, anti-racist institution. But lastly, you know, I'm gonna say this selfishly, invest in the work that we're doing. The, the colleagues that I have in the Division for Student Diversity and Inclusion are, are working and have been working to not look at just Band-Aid solutions, but solutions for systemic problems. So if we're all committed to doing this work, we can't just attend this one event and the event last week and consider ourselves absolved. We need to continue to do this work and have a commitment to not only solving anti-Asian racism, but solving issues of racism across the board. And with that, I would like to make sure that the students have time to really emphasize their own experiences and you know, things that we all can do to serve them better. Thanks. Thank you so much, Aaron, for your wise and insightful words. 
I would like to introduce the two students who will speak next. Matthew Kim is a senior in the School of Arts and Sciences studying computer science. He's the media chair for the Korean Students Association and his interests include Asian representation in media and telling stories through music and film. Jun Park is a first generation immigrant student from South Korea with a passion for social justice and equity in healthcare access and quality. He is a senior in the School of Arts and Sciences studying community health and sociology, and he will be pursuing a master's degree in public health at the Yale School of Public Health this coming fall. June is also treasurer for the Tufts Korean Students Association. Welcome, Matthew and June. Thank you for that introduction. So as Aaron said, we're here to talk about our perspectives as Asian students, as well as represent the perspectives of some of our peers. Uh, first, we wanna address the assumption that Asian students at Tufts don't face any type of serious racism. And we'd like to start by bringing awareness to two incidents that happened just this past week to some of our friends. Uh, on Sunday, a group of Asian students was walking on Professor's Row when a truck uh, filled with white males pulled up and began threatening them with derogatory and racist remarks, some of which are list listed here. The very next day, another group of Asian students was driving on Winthrop Street in broad daylight when another um, white male individual uh, shout yelled at them to quote unquote, go back to fucking China. Both these incidents have been reported and we're still waiting to hear uh, more information about whether the perpetrators are part of the test community or not. Uh, but we're also aware of several other incidents that happened this past year, um, both on the SMFA campus and Tufts campus with more that we're probably unaware of. And what we also want to um, repeat and uh, emphasize is that this is, again, nothing new. This, there's a long history of racism against the Asians at Tufts that reflects the even longer history of racism against the Asians in the rest of the country. Uh, in 1982, the Zeta Psi fraternity crowded around the Asian house uh, chanting derogatory remarks and insults such as um, nuke the gooks. Um, and in April 2009, a freshman uh, started a fight and assaulted uh, several members of the Tufts Korean Student Association as they were practicing for a uh, culture show. Um, as you can see, the same type of language has been used over the past 30 years to threaten Asian students at Tufts. And these are just two examples, not including incidents that were <clears throat> unreported or microaggressions in between. Oh, uh, I don't know what happened. One second. Can everyone see that? So, one second. So, um, I'll just have to do it without the PowerPoint sc screen, but between March 19th, 2020 to February 28, 2021, there has been a total of 3,795 incidents that were reported to stop AAPI hate, which is a nationwide organization that is devoted to making sure that the rising trends of Asian American violence and xenophobia and hatred against Asian Americans are um, being publicized and made aware to the general public. So it shows um, and it proves Aaron's point or made earlier that this is an ongoing trend. It's, it hasn't just begun with the Atlanta shootings or the massacre at Indianapolis. It has been ongoing for years and years. And so we'd like to talk more about Tufts' response to these hate crimes from the perspective of the students. Um, in de on December 4th, 2020, um, Tufts hosted an event called Voices from Chinatown, which was an event planned by uh, Aaron, along with the other directors of diversity and inclusion, health science campuses, and the International Center. And we appreciate your, um, your efforts in creating that event. Um, but by February, we had yet to see a statement from Tufts condemning the violence. And 
overall, it really just felt like not enough. Uh, all the a API culture clubs felt like the university really wasn't doing anything to work against or at least condemn the, ex the existence of hate crimes against APIs on campus and beyond. Um, whereas we saw where other universities pledged concrete action and were quick to um, condemn these, these, these threats. Um, so we, as the API culture clubs, issued a statement to the administration demanding action and a statement from the university. Uh, President Monaco replied a week later, saying that they plan to take an action-oriented response, which mainly focused on an event that the Office of, of DNI would plan, which is this event. But there didn't seem to be a promise of him making a statement. So after meeting with Aaron, Emily, and Andy, we learned that for sure a statement wouldn't be coming from the Office of the President, which was uh, you know, disappointing for us to hear. Uh, but we, as, the, as all the culture clubs, decided to move forward with other actions on our own, uh, such as fundraisers and speaker events. Then finally, on March 18th, after the Atlanta massacre, President Monaco decided to send an announcement to the entire school. So the question remains, why did it take so long for President Monaco and other members of the university administration to condemn violence and xenophobia against AAPIs? First, we would like to acknowledge and thank DOSA, DNI, and the Asian American Center for issuing a statement condemning these violences and xenophobia. But we have to recognize that this, met, that this letter was only targeted towards undergraduate students, faculty, and staff, and parents, not to the general TUPS community. Um, we hoped that a letter from President Monaco from the Office of President would be delivered to the entire TUPS community, Grafton, Medford, Somerville, Fenway, and Boston, so that the entire Tufts community knows how dedicated the university is towards this violence, that they are willing to condemn this violence and work towards resolving it in our communities. So the question remains, is the university serious about its commitments to be an anti-racist institution? Matt and I admit, um, the, these violences against Asian Americans, it wasn't, it wasn't widely recognized until very recently. Um, it wasn't on CNN, it wasn't on MSNBC, it wasn't on the New York Times, but that doesn't relieve the university of its responsibility to its Asian American students and other students of color. So is the university cherry picking which issues to stand by? Is it only standing by issues that are public and well recognized by the American public? So in other words, is this all for a show or are we all actually dedicated towards the commitment to be an anti-racist institution? And on a more practical matter, um, Matt and I, as representatives of a culture club on campus, we have this question of who do we contact when we experience a hate crime on campus? According to Aaron, um, current protocol is to call TUPD or to submit an anonymous complaint to Ethics Point, which at that point will be delivered to DOSA and OEO. We have to think about these option, reporting options. Are we concerned about underreporting? we have to recognize that there are some students who are privileged enough to know that when they call TUPD, that they will be protected by the police, that they will not experience police brutality or any incidents that we hope that will not happen to any students, or faculties, or staff members. There are students on campus, there are faculty members or staff, there are people in our community who do not want to call the police, who fear calling the police. So when we say the, the only option to report hate crimes on campus is to call TPD, are we concerned about underreporting? And on another note, Matt and I have received um, incidences of hate crime through our social media, through messages from students. We are not sure if they have reported them to the university administration in the first place. Which brings up another important question. Are students aware of who to call, of who to contact, when they experience a hate crime on campus? Is there even a resource that they can, centralized resource that they could contact? With everything so decentralized at this point, what are the statistics? How many hate crimes have happened on campus this year? Are university administrators aware of the numbers? We have to remember that the lack of transparency and the lack of knowledge in the number of these bias incidents undermines the issue that's happening at our community it doesn't allow us to realize the importance of how many, of, of how frequent this, these incidents are happening. And remember, last week, there were two incidents targeted towards Asian American students. Uh, finally, we just wanna echo what Aaron said. Um, one, we really just can't focus on 
uh, just one event and call it quits because there's so much other work to be done. And two, we can't really just focus on hate crimes or interpersonal um, issues uh, while ignoring the larger systemic issues that affect not only us, but other, uh, uh, other communities of color and other communities uh, that are underrepresented. Uh, so if you truly want to support Asian students at Tufts, um, discussions like these will only go so far if they don't lead to actual change. We reached out to some of our peers and these are just some of the responses on how to help uh, Asian students. Uh, one example was greater diversity in required first year classes. Students felt like in white dominated classes, it was hard to speak up as minorities as other students would leave very little room for their opinions. Um, second would be awareness of microaggressions um, where students have to face the load of, you know, defending an entire people from derogatory comments. Just a few examples that we've heard are, are comments like, if the US had not intervened in South Korea, we would have ended up starving like North Koreans and K-pop men are gross for wearing makeup. Like, what, what do you say to that? Um, it's, it's, it's wild. Um, and that students and faculty really shouldn't be imposing on Asian students their opinions on how we should process trauma. Finally, and, and definitely most importantly, um, possibly most importantly, is easier access to resources. Um, this is something that affects all vulnerable groups, first gen and international students, especially, but uh, students that we heard from could rarely find this information on Tufts websites and constantly had to send emails to find out more. And this can come through uh, multiple ways. Like Aaron su su said, uh, funding through, um, you know, the, the Asian American Center and student groups, as well as directly from other university offices um, is definitely a great place to start. And, you know, th th these are comments that we've heard from our students in one day. So I, I hope that as we move forward, students and the administration can work together to make these cha uh, changes happen in an ongoing dialogue. And on a final note, um, Matt and I are graduating this year, so our time on campus is limited. But that doesn't mean that um, our efforts to encourage, to urge Tufts to be an anti-racist institution and to protect, defend all students of color is gonna end. As soon to be alumni, we look forward to hearing more about the university's continued commitments as an anti-racist institution. We look forward to hearing from our students, um, our faculty members, our um, and staff members to hear about what Tufts, is, Tufts has been doing to be more anti-racist and to, to protect, defend, and advocate for Asian American students, for LGBTQ students, and other students of color. And with that, um, we would like to thank everyone for giving us the opportunity to talk today, and we look forward to engaging in conversation today and beyond. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew and June, for sharing your perspectives and other students' perspectives. And congratulations on your upcoming graduation. Um, next, everyone is going to go into small group uh, breakout groups. Everyone's going to be assigned and you'll be in your breakout group that is will be facilitated until 5.30 p.m. So there's about half an hour. And when we reconvene, um, Associate Provost and Chief Diversity Officer Rob Mack will um, facilitate the report back. Thank you. Wait for your assignment. All right, welcome back. welcome back everyone. Uh, I hope that you had an excellent discussion with your groups and I know it's uh, hard to join these group uh, larger discussions and I get to hear from everyone. Uh, but oftentimes the smaller groups really allow to hear uh, more voices and um, have more opportunity for people to engage. So we hope that it was a good experience and that um, the opportunities to learn from one another was present. Uh, we have to do a what we're going to call a lightning round of report backs um, because we had about 10 groups and we want to definitely hear the highlights from each group. Um, and we're going to call on, I'm going to call upon the facilitators to do a quick report back on their highlights from their groups and we will, um, you know, bring this to a close. So we're going to start with Hope Freeman. How did I know you were going to call me first? Because hey, y'all. <laughs> So my name is Hope Freeman. I use she, her, hers for my pronouns. Um, our group had a really great discussion just around how, um, talking about how a lot of these kind of 
hate, like folks have been a lot more brazen during this time around like hate and attacks and things um, and how that's definitely intensified a lot around this time. And then just having political or public figures exacerbating it has been really challenging. Um, one of the things that we talked about was the role of the model minority myth and what it, how it plays. Um, and some of the folks in the group says it plays a lot into hate crimes, especially when thinking about how Asian Americans or AAPI folks are seen as meek or seen as quiet and the quiet ones won't resist. That's a direct quote from someone in our group. And as a result, um, folks will definitely be a lot more or try to do a lot more harm. Also talked about the other end around like folks being really smart, really successful. And as a result, people don't need um, uh, like mentorship or folks are like, well, what are you complaining about? Because you're smart, you get more money, you do all of these things. And so talking about how that's really harmful, especially when we're thinking about how folks are just interacting in general. Um, a lot of things we also talked about was someone in our group brought up around um, faculty evaluation. So faculty finding ways to intervene or think about how they can intervene when these things happen and bringing it up more in um, conversation. We talked about there being way more resources if we're thinking about education for Asian American and um, Asian studies. Um, as well as like degree progression, right? So this idea that it builds up to something instead of it just being like an add-on. And also talking about how are we developing curiosity when students come into Tufts around how I can take these classes or have a different major or even get a better framing of Tufts anti-racist approaches. Um, I think that was it. We had a really good conversation. So um, I wanted to thank my group for that. Excellent. This thank is a lightning know. round. Otherwise, I would ask folks if they wanted to add, but um. <laughs> I, I appreciate that. Thank you so much, Hope. Uh, next, we'll call on Steve. Yes, uh, thank you, Rob. Um, in the spirit of the lightning round, <laughs> I, I will uh, say that um, in an effort to center student voices, we began with uh, the students in our group. Um, and they really picked up on the experiences that Matthew, June, and Aaron spoke to, that language is important when the leadership at the head of the nation uses virulent hate speech and communicates a message to the public that this is okay, permission is unleashed to uh, attack others and um, spew hatred, um, and that this is uh, really uh, a huge part of the problem. Um, that uh, too bad we don't have leadership where uh, leaders are able to take responsibility for their own actions and support others. Um, it was also observed that this sort of gathering is preaching to the choir and the people who make the kinds of comments that uh, Matthew and June spoke about are not on the call. Um, that being said, I also wanna add that in the spirit of a lightning round, um, I was so impressed with the genuineness and authenticity and emotional aliveness of the members of my group and what they had to say. We didn't get past the first question. And the whole issue of opening up these spaces and the time urgency that we all live with is such a quandary. We don't have a solution, but we could have spoken for hours on this the intensity, the feeling, the immediacy is there. These issues are so central to the well-being and life of our community. I just hope we can find other ways to continue to deepen this process. Thank you. That's great. Thank you, Steve, and appreciate those notes. Um, next, Adriana. Hi, everyone. I'm Adriana Black. I use the She Series. I really wanna give a huge shout out to my group. Everyone present um, spoke and shared something which I value so much. And we talked a lot about kind of, I, I think we talked a lot about history, we talked a lot about present and we talked a lot about the future. And I think that um, centering on the history, um, one of the things that we discussed is the fact that history just continues to repeat itself. And giving a huge shout out to Erica Lee who discussed the historical perspective of racism and hate in the AAPI community and how we really need to know that and realize that so much of that is still alive and well today, which brings us to the present where we talked about really being able to, to be able to 
do things as a community, we need to build that community. And we know that the Tufts um, Health Sciences campus is located in Boston. And the fact that that is in Chinatown and being able to work with communities in Chinatown to be able to not assume, but to ask what it is that they need and how we can support one another. And then really looking towards the future, we discuss the reality of various systems as well as interpersonal relationships that are at play that perpetuate these systems of oppression and this hatred and this white supremacy culture and that we really need to in the future ensure that we're focusing on all various aspects of oppression to be able to unite and move against the common foe and ensure that that's not something that that we're not dividing ourselves and that we're really building coalitions together. Thank you. Thanks so much Adriana. Uh, next Marin. All right, so our group um, talked about, you know, just we really started off our conversation talking about the fact that, you know, anti-Asian racism is a serious issue that often goes unaddressed. Um, and there's a lot of frustration around that. Um, and so we talked a little bit about sort of where that comes from, um, whether that be not perceiving um, Asian and Asian American um, members of our communities as, you know, racialized, um, that has to do with um, just a number of different issues. Um, but these issues go unaddressed. And one of the big, bigger concerns that was raised during our discussion was really talking about how do we address these, you know, these instances of, of hate and hate crimes at Tufts. Um, you know, there needs to be greater education across the board um, for faculty, staff, and students on things like the model minority myth, um, on things like anti-Asian racism frequency and, you know, the, the presence of it on college campuses. Um, schools have to, a few schools in our group, we had some wonderful folks from the, the dental and veterinary school who shared with us um, that they're doing some programming with Asian American and Asian students to try to mitigate some of the impact of this um, on their you know, day to day studies. Um, but really, there needs to be a major cultural shift to share stories about AAPI people, ones that break down stereotypes, ones that create sort of, you know, opportunities to challenge tropes. Um, and then there really need to be more um, concerted efforts to assist students on campus before an event happens and to be proactive, as well as, um, you know, provide education um, in terms of events like these um, to, to ensure that the university community is developing collectively a base level of knowledge that's needed in order to, to engage effectively with their peers. That's all. That was a lot. Thank you, Mary. Uh, let's go to Kelly. Hi, I'm Kelly O'Byrne. Um, and um, thank you to my group as well. We had um, great discussion. Um, I think we started with just the general surprise and, and shock at what goes on at the university that we may not be aware of. And the fact that everyone being remote, we don't, we feel even um, maybe more disconnected to um, events that are going on. Um, we also talked a lot about, you know, the concern for students and how to support, best support um, our students, um, removing those obstacles um, that, you know, uh, they need to feel safe and to move forward. Um, and we also talked about just that whole theme of what actions can we can we take? And, you know, maybe feeling like um, it, we haven't, you know, necessarily taken enough action um, in the past. Um, and what resources can we provide when, you know, we're faced with people or um, people in our groups, our schools, um, our teams that are struggling with things? Um, who should we go to? Um, we talked also about the model minority and that, um, this this is still happening um, even to our younger generations coming out of um, 
public school or schools, high schools, um, elementary schools. There's this, even though this generation was raised with more inclusive education, it's still existing. We talked um, a little bit about how to take action when you witness some of these things happening, um, but how that can also be difficult and especially difficult for the particular group that um, is um, targeted, if you will. Um, so, you know, feeling um, kind of, you know, tired and not putting the onus on, you know, whether it be Asian, people of color, LGBTQ, women, whatever it, whatever that might be. Um, and, you know, when, when to speak up and when not to and what factors influence that. Um, and we also talked a little bit about art in um, how art plays into this as well. So using art for the good, to educate, to showcase, and then also how do you deal with, you know, potential issues in art that can be triggering, um, but yet could potentially start um, good discussion. So I think I, I think I summed up. Oh, and that we're lucky to be at a university at least that is taking time to address this as well. Great, thank you, Kelly. Uh, next, Nandi. Yeah, um, so I will try to keep it brief, um, but we spent a lot of our time in our group talking about um, how the um, model minority myth really manifests throughout the institution, right? So not just as people may often first think in a classroom space or in, um, with students, but also as it reverberates through faculty and staff in the ways that they feel like um, they can and cannot um, show up for each other. We, we spent a lot of time also talking about, um, you know, how, how to transition to community-oriented political action, right, and also um, creating coalitions across um, different identity groups to, to sort of combat white supremacy right overall um and recognizing that that's where we really need to be focusing attention um and um and then finally we we did take a little time at the end just to think about um to focus on the joy right um we had a a person sort of say that in our group that said that it often feels like you're sort of in a black hole um with the how we're inundated with all of these really difficult pieces and to also um, think about the places of connection that people have been able to, to make in community and on campus and hold that in balance as we move uh, towards making change. So I will stop there. Really appreciate that. Uh, next, Katrina. Oh my gosh, I almost hit the leave button. Um, <laughs> Uh, it's been a long day. Um, I had a really great um, conversation with our group and we um, we had a lot of, of really great sharing and talked a lot about um, not just the, um, there was sharing around experiences that people have had um, either on campus or off and what's happening. We had someone who is working at a hospital in, in Kittery, Maine, um, and the experiences that they are having um, uh, just trying to do their job, actually. Um, but the main focus of our conversation was around the uh, meaning of white supremacy and what, how that plays into all of the things that, that are happening across the country um, on Tufts campus how that is the foundation and the root of um, how this country was built and um, how that manifests itself in the things that are happening. Um, because I think that um, there was someone who said that um, being Asian doesn't really count or ingrained attitudes that, um, that, that, perpetuate the notion that white is baseline and everything else is other. Um, and until we are really willing to grapple with how um, white supremacy and systemic racism works and plays out 
um, we will not be able to make um, the, the necessary changes that will need to be made to be able to move from having wonderful conversations like this, but into having actionable things um, change to help us to make change. Um, and so I'm really um, ha hoping that this Tufts table will be the start of um, us being able to do a lot of self-reflection, a lot of education, um, um, you know, learning as much as we can about how the country really operates and, and how we dismantle the fact that it, is, it was not built for us to succeed. Well said, thank you, Katrina. Uh, next, Abby. Hi everyone, I'm Abigail and wonderful um, to be still staying with the group today. I wanted to share something that weren't said yet by the other groups. Um, my group really talked about you know, the need for all members of the Tufts community to not just those who are experiencing incidents of violence to really lean into the discomfort of having these challenging conversations regarding race and oppression and violence and um, really centering students' experiences in deciding next steps. And one thing that was brought up in my group was the need for you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion and justice education to being a requirement for all students, but also all faculty, whether that be through um, disciplines and majors and courses um, and training for all that are really a part of the university um, because there are gaps in education as is talked about in those questions. And it is the institution of Tufts' obligation to address those gaps as best as it can. Um, and also really paying attention to that the university cannot pick and choose what acts of hate are responded to because that only feeds into this model minority myth that um, just because racism might look differently depending on the group that's affected, it doesn't mean that it's not there and it doesn't mean that all members of the test community should feel supported um, and addressed when incidents or acts of violence either are happening and are extremely visible or if they aren't as visible and underreported um, like the students before shared with us so bravely and confidently. And uh, yeah, wonderful discussion today and hoping for many more dialogues and conversations like this. Thank you. Thanks, appreciate that. Uh, next, Jared Smith. Yeah, so um, we had a lot of great themes. I'm just gonna try and quickly like bullet point them. Um, so number one, uh, we talked about the erasure of, um, you know, impact and presence in this nation for as long as it's been around. Um, we also spoke about the power of language and how its use has either vilified or impacted the way that um, folks within this country view and understand politics globally. So specifically in the realms of um, Asian countries. Uh, we also talked about how the statistics uh, that we were describing also don't in, or not the full picture. Um, so like the internal uh, ramifications of racism and white supremacy have um, an impact that we will never be able to quantify in the, the realm of the conversation that we were having. Um, in addition, we, we also talked about how uh, the model minority myth will never save any person from the impacts of racism and white supremacy and how there is a, in a sense, a double consciousness of uh, the bootstrap politics of like I've succeeded because I worked really hard while also having, you know, the 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 conflict of if I don't adhere to this form of um, expectations, then what does that mean? And how do I navigate those systems as an individual? Um, and then uh, one resource was shared that I really wanted to share with the rest of the group, which was um, a book titled Asian American Achievement Parad the Asian American Achievement Paradox as a resource very much worth reading. Um, and I know that I'll be taking a look at it. Um, and thank you to my group for a great conversation. Great, thank you, Jared. And to our last group, uh, the unknown facilitator in room number eight. Uh, well, our facilitator is Nancy Thompson, but she had to leave early. So I'm, I'm substitute Nancy uh, for right now, Kevin Kraft from Student Affairs. Um, so uh, really quickly, uh, you know, probably the, the things that are most useful from our conversation to report out are the action items that we talked about. So we, we spent a little bit of time thinking about 
you know, what are the kind of things that that Tufts could do that we could do uh, to to try and make improvements? And we started with listening to the things that were asked for uh, by the students in the presentation before the breakout room. Um, so we talked about a couple of things. You know, one is this idea that we really need to think about the first year experience uh, at Tufts, um, both from, you know, right from first year orientation all the way through uh, the rest of the first year experience, you know, how are people assigned to rooms? How do we help people develop empathy for each other during this process? You know, it's um, uh, the curriculum requirement also part of this, you know, we've talked about reorienting the world civilization requirement to something that would um, address this a little more directly. And I think there was uh, a, an idea that that could be supportive and part of that experience. Um, a second big one that I think people were thinking about that was um, responsive to what was shared was this idea of transparency, um, you know, both in terms of you know, there were there were fairly straightforward calls for just information and data that were shared at the beginning, and it seems like it'd be reasonably easy to put that information together. Um, and two, to think about how do we use that information um, to create timely responses, you know, and also ultimately to get to proactive responses and not just sort of responding and uh, after things have happened, but to really kind of reorient the idea of what the university is doing to think about how do we proactively uh, address these things. Uh, and then we did talk about a couple of things on the on the reactive side after something has happened. Um, you know, how do you uh, feel seen and how do you know what to do after you have a report uh, after something's happened to you that you want to report? Um, so we talked about a couple ideas with that. So I'll for the lightning round, I'll stop it. All right, many thanks to all the facilitators for both facilitating and reporting back and doing so um, in, a, in a speed round. So we um, can finish our program on time. So many thanks to all of you. Uh, certainly don't like to bring a program of such importance with such important dialogue happening to an end, but on, be on behalf of Provost Aubrey, Joy Sackey and myself, the Bridging Differences Committee, we really appreciate all of you for attending. Um, the words today by Aaron, Matthew, and June were humbling, and I um, felt that a lot of the conversations from the report back really reflected the power of their words and that opportunity. Uh, we have to move forward as a university collectively, and we must look at the systems, and we must look at our actions, and we must look at our responsibilities to be reflective in this work. Um, and I think all that has really been highlighted here and really greatly appreciate everyone as a community coming together to join us for this Tufts Table event. Um, we are excited that we were able to provide it, but we know it is just one program and lots of real work and action needs to take place and that is not lost on us. Um, so with that, um, I thank all the organizers, all the behind the scenes people and um, everyone else who contributed in a way that uh, made this a positive experience. Uh, I wish you all a very good night.